Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Uh, today, I want to take you to early in the morning, about 8 o'clock a.m. on June 6th, 1862, Baltimore, Maryland. There's a train coming into town, steam locomotive. It's not allowed to go directly into town because Baltimore was pretty much a city of wood and brick and steam trains with coal-driven fire engines were not particularly safe. So the train came to a station close to the inner city. Inside that train was the man pictured here, the popular colonel of the Union 1st Maryland Infantry. His name is John Reese Kenley was well known and beloved by the citizens of Baltimore, at least the Union sympathetic citizens, that is. He arrived and there was quite a crowd of fans and admirers waiting for him. But there's no way that could have been prepared to see what he looked like when he got off the train. Just a couple weeks earlier, he was in battle and suffered some serious injuries. And when he got off the train, those who saw him couldn't help but see a deep saber cut in the back of his head, a bullet wound close by that cut, and then another cut, a smaller saber wound on his neck, plus heavy bruises on his face, shoulders, and chest. He was in bad shape. All these injuries had occurred in that recent battle, which occurred at Front Royal, Virginia. There, Confederate General Stonewall Jackson was wrapping up his storied Shenandoah Valley campaign, and he was getting the best of the Union forces, commanded by Major General Nathaniel P. Banks. Now, General Banks had located much of his force at Strasbourg, Virginia, and left smaller detachments at Winchester and Front Royal, where Kenley and his 1st Maryland Infantry were garrisoned, along with some other Union forces, but a relatively small contingent, maybe about a 1,000. On May 23rd, an enemy force sent by Jackson about three times the number of Kenley's men attacked. The honor of leading that Confederate advance fell to another 1st Maryland Infantry commanded by Colonel Bradley Johnson. According to historians, this is the first and only time in American history that two state regiments with the same numerical designation, fought head to head. I'm always wary of claims of the first or the only. Haven't checked this out, but my preliminary research tells me this is true. Kenley's Marylanders put up a stiff resistance. They made a stand at a place called Richardson's Hill, deploying artillery to hold off the oncoming Confederates. But those Confederates eventually threatened their line of escape. Kenley made an orderly withdrawal to another hill, Guard Hill, where they made a second stand. Then they were forced back. They fell. They retreated again to a third and what became a final stand. That didn't work. That was at Cedarville. Here, a well-timed and a well-directed attack by about 250 Confederate cavalrymen shattered Kenley's last position. Cut off from any escape, Kenley had no option but surrender. The overall fighting lasted about two hours. I want to read you this newspaper report from the Baltimore Sun. This is the source that I found the information about Kenley getting off the train. I want to read you a little bit, a passage from a little down lower in the article where they describe a little bit more about the action and the confrontation of the two first Marylands. So here we go. Quote, 
There were 650 of the 1st Maryland Infantry Union engaged in the fight at Front Royal, together with two guns of Knapp's battery and several companies of cavalry. The fight commenced at one and a half o'clock in the afternoon and continued throughout the afternoon. This report actually has it going to six o'clock. I'm not sure that's correct. Anyway, I'll continue. A number of the Ashby Cavalry and the Louisiana Tigers, these are the Confederate units, commanded by Major Wheat and a number of the 1st Maryland Regiment Confederate, who had disbanded after the Battle of Bull Run, but had reformed again, constituted the infantry, together with several Virginia infantry regiments, who were the attacking party upon Colonel Kenley's command. The article doesn't say it, but it's about 3,000 to 1,000. The story continues, it is needless to recount anything in regard to the fight. <laughs> they don't want to get into the details here about Maryland versus Maryland. The story continues, it is needless to recount anything in regard to the fight, save and accept to peremptorily deny on the authority of Colonel Kenley that any brutality was shown by the Confederates towards himself or his wounded men. Kenley speaks in the highest terms of the manner in which he was cared for after being taken prisoner and from his own observation, having been paroled and allowed to go about the city of Winchester, the wounded men, officers included, were treated in the like kind manner. So there's that description of the Baltimore Sun being very careful to say that when the fighting was over, when the deed was done and Kenley's men surrendered, the Confederate Marylanders did not mistreat them. Now, you may be wondering what happened next. Paroled to Baltimore after that slight uh, break in Winchester, that train trip back to Baltimore, Kenley eventually recovered from the wounds and the bruises. He was eventually formally exchanged and he received his Brigadier General Star for his courage and gallantry at Front Royal, even though it was a loss. Those three last stands were remembered well by his superior officers. Kenley went on to command on the brigade level for much of the rest of the war. And afterwards, he returned to Baltimore and his chosen profession as a lawyer. However, he had trouble supporting himself. I didn't really get to find any details about why, but he had trouble and he eventually fell into poverty. He was quite poor and poverty stared him in the face quite regularly. However, in the face all of all of this, he refused to accept charity. He refused to apply for a pension, which he had earned for his Civil War service. He also had qualified for another pension for his Mexican War service, which I didn't talk about here, but he has a long connection to the battles around the Mexican War, which in which he distinguished himself. Qualifying for pensions, he refused to get one because he thought that it would tarnish his patriotism for the Constitution and for the United States. After Kenley died impoverished in 1891, at age 73, his old adversary from the Battle of Front Royal, Colonel Johnson, he paid a tribute to that modest hero, Kenley. One of the lines that stood out from Johnson's words, Johnson's praise of Kenley was, quote, he would not sell his blood for gold, nor commute his patriotism for greenbacks, end quote. What a great tribute from a former adversary. Now, Kenley did leave behind a book which gives another clue to his character. He was obviously modest. He obviously believed in patriotism and observing it in a very pure way. But in a book that he wrote in 1873, which wasn't about the Civil War, it was his memoirs 
of a Maryland volunteer, The War with Mexico. In that book, he dedicates it to Zachary Taylor, who Kenley considered the true type of the American soldier. Now, Zachary Taylor, as you students of the Civil War know, was a model for many Civil War generals, notably Ulysses S. Grant. Zachary Taylor's opposite was Winfield Scott, old fuss and feathered feathers who liked to wear the uniform prescribed to the fullest extent of the law with all of the gold trim and braid and everything else, whereas Zachary Taylor wore a plain private's blouse. And so that was the soldier that Kenley aspired to be, and I believe he actually was, and he lived that pure life of a patriot. So there you have it, the story of John Reese Kenley of the Union 1st Maryland Infantry. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.